Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas DeMoncho. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, um, the host with the Graduate School of Journalism um, uh, of our uh, lecture here tonight. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Kevin Delaney to the Art, Technology, and Culture Lecture Series. Um, since its founding in 1997 by my colleague Ken Goldberg, the Art, Technology, and Culture Series and expa is expansion as part of the Berkeley Center for New Media in 2005 has brought leading thinkers and practitioners at the intersection of the arts, culture, technology, and design um, uh, to the Berkeley campus. Um, since uh, uh, 2016, we have been also proud to participate um, uh, in this evening's framing um, and organizing series, the uh, Arts and Design Mondays series organized by the Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design on, uh, on campus, Shannon Jackson, and her office. We're particularly grateful to uh, Shannon and the A plus D office for covering the rent here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Art Film Archive, so uh, which helps us all uh, speak to you in such a wonderful venue. Um, <laughs> thumbs up. Um, the lecture tonight, co-hosted with journalism, is uh, the second in an annual series inaugurated with last year's um, a conversation with Frank Farr and Nick Thompson on examining the future of the news media and its role in shaping the future. Um, uh, I think it's particularly appropriate then um, that we also share tonight's uh, conversation uh, with the cameras of C-SPAN, um, uh, itself an important instrument of uh, technology and media in the public service, um, uh, which is a, a very much in line with the larger mission of this great public university. I can think of few people more qualified to think with us about these questions than Quartz's founding editor, um, Kevin J. Delaney. Kevin co-founded the influential business news website in 2012, and at a time when the news media as a whole has been profoundly challenged by shifts in the global economy and the evolution of social uh, media-driven uh, information economies, um, Quartz has thrived. Kevin's grounding for the remarkable success of Quartz clearly lies in his previous experience, not only as the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal's website, where he successfully led efforts to greatly expand the journal's online readership with award-winning um, dedicated digital features, but also in his previous experience covering technology as a correspondent um, for the journal uh, in the Bay Area and Europe. Quartz's international strategy, including a remarkable focus on India and Africa as two undercovered regions of the globe with thriving and voracious audiences for good journalism, is part of its many remarkable strengths and is reflected also in Kevin's current membership of the Council on Foreign Relations. But if we were to truly ground Kevin's current achievements in his past and values, I would tell another, maybe slightly more embarrassing story uh, I did not know Kevin well as an undergraduate, even though we overlapped at Yale for my first two years and his last. Thankfully, we rectified the situation quickly after we both graduated, and I got to know Kevin in Paris while I was living in London, London after college. I know, tough luck. Um, but even um, while two years behind him in school, I did very much know him by reputation. At the time, journalism at Yale, probably a bit like journalism everywhere at the time, was a very clubby affair. Even though some of us were already discovering the internet in underground fluorescently lit, lit computer labs where somehow cigarette smoking was allowed but windows were not, um, above ground, um, uh, there was only one very well-established news source, the oldest college daily with its uh, clubhouse-like wood paneled building and blue chip Rolodex of alumni connections. The Yale Daily News at the time was very much not available to, to all. Rather, the assumption or presumption was that each Yale undergraduate would pay for a subscription for a little rolled up piece of paper that would be inserted in your uh, post office box on campus, not even where you lived. Um, uh, for even a resolutely middle class undergraduate by myself, like myself, the idea of spending money that I desperately needed for things like um, pizza and shoes on journalism was uh, laughable. Um, by the time I arrived on the campus, in fact, the Yale Daily News was so out of touch with its readership that subscriptions were declining, um, uh, uh, and not to mention uh, 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 exhibiting an institution that was so allied, allied with the traditional ways, way of doing things that it rarely took power to task. 
Into this gap stepped an upstart publication, the weekly De Yale Herald, enabled very much, as Kevin reminded me this evening, very much by technology, in this case, Macintosh Desktop Publishing. Um, and it came into its own under his leadership as the most accessible, thoughtful, and muckraking media pre presence on campus, supported by advertising accessible to all and responsible only to its readership. Not only that, but unlike the hierarchical rituals of paying one's dues at the Daily News, where you literally ascended from floor to floor over your years of graduation, Kevin created um, uh, manifestly an environment uh, uh, that was truly an alternative culture um, to that. Uh, approachable, non-hierarchical, participative, and fun. I remember it very distinctly as one of the first examples I had in my own career of the fact that all those qualities were not just uh, uh, the opposite of excellence in work, but were in fact essential to them. Almost the next year, the Yale Daily News gave in and started distributing itself for free, and a broader media ecology began to thrive. As I've discussed it since with Kevin, he actually faced what seemed like a very difficult choice um, uh, as an undergraduate. Dedicated to a career in journalism since high school, every piece of advice he was getting was to join the Rolodex unlocking juggernaut um, of traditional media authority. Instead, he decided to focus on readers and on the news itself, and the best way to serve a changing audience in the increasingly economically, ethnically, and cultural diver culturally diverse undergraduate population. And Kevin, as I would like to think about it, maybe didn't get what he thought he wanted, but in fact, what we all actually needed. The beginning of a lifetime of optimism and innovation amidst a transforming media landscape. So not only has it all turned out okay for him, I think it's very much uh, has a greater chance for turning out okay for all of us as a result. Um, to continue to have Kevin's patient, thoughtful intelligence, creating supportive communities of journalists to help support the rest of us the way only journalism can. On behalf of myself, indeed, Andrew Wasserman of the Journalism School, please join me in welcoming Kevin J. Delaney to Berkeley. It's an amazing introduction. Very few people go as far back as your college newspaper. Nicholas, Nicholas didn't mention that one of our great secrets is we covered intramural sports and the Yale Daily News could not be brought to cover intramural sports. So that was the secret circa 1993. Um, thank you all for coming here tonight. I wanna to start just by thanking Nicholas, who's a dear friend, uh, for bringing uh, uh, me back here to speak tonight and also bringing me back to Berkeley where my family lived very happily uh, for five years. When I think about what interdisciplinary thinking means, um, I think about Nicholas, and I think my appreciation of inter interdisciplinary thinking um, owes a lot to him. Nicholas, my wife, Lisbeth, is a social entrepreneur, and Nicholas somehow has managed to collaborate with both of us, despite Lisbeth and I being actually in very separate fields. So he's one of the smartest people I know and a real bridge um, so thank you, and thank you for having me here. So I'm going to start by telling you about two people who in, in some ways are heroes of mine in the news industry. So the first one is Maria Ressa. So some of you may know her. She's the, fo the founder of a site called Rappler. It's in the Philippines and has written pretty critically about President Duterte and his civil rights, human rights abuses there. And in return for that, she finds herself now facing five criminal charges for tax evasion that could lead up to 10 years in jail. Uh, when I spoke to her recently, she had to get permission from two separate judges in the Philippines to actually travel outside of the, the country. But for all of that, Maria said she was optimistic. With a few other journalists, including Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post writer who, as best we can tell, was murdered by the Saudi government. She was named one of Time's People of the Year. You can see the cover here. And Maria felt that, that had, her raised profile would help keep her safe. Uh, she'd been speaking with Facebook. She was optimistic that they had hired smart people and were serious about getting some of the abuses that were taking place on their platform uh, under control. And I said to her, after all of that, after all the abuses, uh, after everything, after the mobilization of the Duterte thugs about the propaganda that happened on Facebook, was she really sure that she was optimistic about the future? Yes, 
she said she was. Around the same time, I was in touch with Samir Patil. He's the founder of Scroll in India. It's a five-year-old publication that's modeled on the Atlantic. And somewhat predictably, he has fallen afoul of um, Narendra Modi's government and people who are affiliated with him. Um, but, but Samir is optimistic too. As a wave of media layoffs, and we'll talk about them, was announced in the US recently, Samir texted me and he said, all this investment has helped everyone climb a learning curve. So while no individual company has made everything work, the components are clear. What is also clear is that quality is the only defensible editorial strategy, which means many things based on context, but original journalism is certainly a key element, and this is a surprise positive lesson. Samir believes the media is wringing its hands too much and not seeing the opportunities it has uncovered. Thought experiment, he texted. If BuzzFeed gets the same money, half a billion dollars, it raised earlier with all the collective learning until today, they would kick ass. As an aside, if anyone here is looking for a good way to support civil society in the face of strongman autocracy, Samir and Maria Rappler uh, and Scroll are very worthy places for you to channel your investment. I'm naturally focused on opportunities too. As Nicholas said, I co-founded Quartz in 2012 with the backing of David Bradley, who owned The Atlantic, a small band of us from places such as The Economist, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, New York Times, assembled to create a new kind of news organization focused on delivery to mobile devices and open to the social web, while building on the quality journalism and global worldview that the places we'd come from exhibited in their best moments. The last decade has been tough on important parts of the news landscape, particularly in local news, with the devastating loss of newsroom jobs and public accountability that those journalists used to bring. But in other areas, it is a remarkable age of journalism, and Quartz is one example at hand. Our website at one point reached close to 25 million readers in a month, not that far from the size of the Wall Street Journal, and several times the size of The Economist audience. Roughly half of our readers come from outside of the US, and they include several million readers a month from India, and at times over a million readers a month from Africa. And as Nicholas noted, those are two places that we've targeted. We have over 100 full-time journalists on five different continents. We've won a Loeb Award, which is sort of the business news equivalent of a Pulitzer. And Apple selected our app as one of the top 10 apps of the year. Quartz was sold this summer at just five years old to a Japanese media company at a valuation of close, approaching $100 million, significantly in excess of the investment required to create it. So Quartz's story is one of the possibilities opened up by the free web, the global distribution available via Facebook, and other platforms that will succeed it, and the enthusiasm of advertisers to back new approaches to media. But before I turn to where I see news of the future, I feel like I need to further acknowledge the context of today. If anyone had fantasies that this digital news thing was especially easy or lucrative, uh, they probably were shattered in recent weeks, or they should have been. U US media organizations cut over 2,000 jobs just since the beginning of the year, with digital pathfinders, Vice, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, among those firing journalists. Writing in The Guardian, Emily Bell of Columbia University concluded, a digital free market for journalism doesn't work. Farhad Manju in the New York Times said the same thing with a more tortured metaphor. He said, working in digital media is like trying to build a fort out of marshmallows on a foundation made of marbles in a country ruled by capricious and tyrannical warring robots. Um, so Emily acknowledged that the New York Times and the Washington Post were succeeding thanks to their subscription models, but argued that few others could replicate their brands or their resources. Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1787, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or, a, or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. He wrote that in 1787. And for those of us who feel similarly, the current climate for media business can be discouraging. That's even before discussing a president who is called the press, the enemy of the people, before discussing concerns that his acolytes 
might heed that whistle and do what one does to enemies, attack them, kill them, hold them captive. And before getting into how Trump hasn't fully acknowledged or condemned the Saudi government's role in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. So as Nicholas previewed before, I've known that I've wanted to be a journalist since a teenager, and this is in fact the newsroom of the Yale Herald circa 1993. Um, I decided very early on I wanted to spend my life uh, contributing to our better understanding the world and each other, to knowing what's really going on as best we can, to hold the powerful accountable, to help channel humanity's better, better instincts uh, towards solutions. I'm motivated by the pursuit of the truth. I've lived and worked in three different countries and married a citizen of a fourth, and so I'm highly biased toward the free exchange of ideas and experiences. I view journalism as an important public service, one that's vital and worthy, even if there's not a great business model, or political and business leader, leaders attack it, or even if the public professes not to trust journalists, which is the truth. We can endeavor to do better and make things better and be trustworthy. So I come to this question of the future of news from that perspective. The future of news is likely to be hard, but it's not optional. So the pragmatic optimism and bravery of Maria and Samir anchors me as we turn from the fog of today and actually look ahead. So for starters, one thing I think we can say with certainty is that the dominance of the primary digital platforms for distribution of news today, Facebook and Google, will decrease. Part of this is by choice. In its effort to curtail manipulation of its platform by propaganda and disinformation, Facebook has also dramatically reduced the amount of news that people see on it. Take Quartz, for example. In March 2017, readers came via Facebook and registered over 13 million page views on Quartz. A year later, that was 4 million, a decline of roughly 70% in our ability to reach readers via Facebook. I should note that readers reach us other ways, and so thankfully, uh, Quartz's audience has remained stable throughout this period. Part of this is also that Facebook's various scandals and shortcomings seem to mean Americans use it less. Delete Facebook may not be a tidal wave, but adults in America spend about 12% of their online time on Facebook, and that's a fifth less than two years ago, according to Pivotal Research. It is a certainty that Facebook and Google will be regulated by governments in, U in Europe, and likely here as well. Roger McNamee in his new book, Zucked, which just came out, lays out some of the directions this could take from blocking Facebook from acquiring any more companies to using antitrust law to actually break Facebook into pieces. Facebook will probably experience the hobbling of its business swagger that Microsoft experienced 20 years ago. I understand people now, some people are embarrassed to work there. It'll be harder to attract and retain talent and this will create opportunities for new entrants. So we have an opportunity today through our choices select and shape the news platforms of tomorrow. There's Apple News, an aggregation service which already reaches 90 million readers every month. Flipboard quietly chugs along. It has 145 million readers a month. Reddit last year had 330 million monthly users, putting it at or above the level of Twitter. Interestingly, in the case of Reddit, it's human moderation rather than algorithms that drive the usage. Each subreddit is moderated by volunteer users who may actually be better than AI at finding and curating news. Reddit is not perfect, uh, we know this, but the human hand in curating is an important um, signal and it points to the power of the importance of humans in creating our information commons. Then there's Netflix and Spotify. It's hard to imagine them not becoming news purveyors of some sort or other as they look to expand. Spotify's acquisition of Gimlet, a podcast studio, for reportedly for over $200 million is an explicit signal that Spotify is moving beyond music and towards news. Quartz has launched its own platform for news. It's an app for iOS and Android where you can catch up on, share, and comment on the news but has very deliberate choices about how it is structured. 
Journalists actually curate the home screen where you, and select the stories that you see. Comments are moderated, and you can only comment once per article. So you can't shout at other people in the comments in all caps like some people like to do. All of this is good and is a powerful signal that people want news and not just the filter bubble that Facebook's algorithms might put them in the middle of. And on top of it, the chances of a foreign government's manipulation of our collective psyche uh, to sway an election decrease when the news universe is more diverse, is structured to avoid manipulation, and includes human judgment as to what is actually true. I'm guessing that this uh, will be a bestseller on Telegraph Avenue if it is not already, <laughs> this t-shirt. Um, one enormous area that needs addressing is how all these platforms, Facebook and Google included, share revenue with the creators of news. Local news especially has suffered ad revenue as ad revenue has been siphoned off by the digital platforms. Facebook and Google are, have committed to spending together uh, a total of $600 million over the next three years in supporting journalism. But this is a sort of philanthrocapitalism that Anand Jiraharadas and others have criticized more broadly. Facebook and Google have used surveillance capitalism to nab all of the new advertising dollars, and that $600 million over three years represents the smallest fraction of their spoils, just 1% of their net income last year. Facebook profits were $22 billion in 2018. Google parent alphabets were $31 billion. So the shareholder maximizing Silicon Valley approach needs tempering. One question is whether any of the news platforms would engage in a serious reset on this front rather than just charity aiming at appeasing governments and would-be critics in the media. Facebook has said it, can't, it won't solve the news media's problems. Sure, but it has chosen not to fully acknowledge its role in the structural problems facing how people get their news and how professionals are paid to produce it. So we are where we are. Okay, looking forward. I predict that the news of future will continue to break free from the constraints of newspaper manufacturing from an earlier century as it has over the last decade. Until shockingly recently, articles were by default on the range of 700 words long. This was a standard unit of production of news organizations and part of it is that if you're laying out a print newspaper, uh, it's much easier to to fit 700 word articles together. Charts and photos all sat alongside articles and boxes because the content management systems and layout systems couldn't actually process those things as part of the flow of the text. Reporters didn't write their own headlines because only the person laying metal type in the, in the manufacturing part of the news process knew how many character spaces there were for the headline to fit as this gentleman is doing right here. When I was a reporter, we still didn't write headlines, even though this guy had retired years, years or decades before. So we've broken free of that. Today, it's much more common to read an article that is a series of charts or photos or GIFs linked by writing. Axios, an, an upstart news site, their journalism is largely bullet-pointed text. Quartz has an app where users, and some of you may be familiar with this, you have the experience of chatting with someone about the news. It's like you would in text messages. And I, we have journalists who write the scripts for that. This is the app that Apple said was one of the best 10 apps of the year. Uh, and we have a very loyal user base for it. News organizations increasingly use the stories format that Snapchat developed, weaving text and video and graphics. I love a 2,000 word feature article, but believe it's positive, positive that news is increasingly being delivered in the idioms that technology allows and users are accustomed to and freed from the newspaper manufacturing process finally. There are new and more interesting forms of journalism that we've yet to see due to the limitations of previous platforms and our preconceptions about what news actually looks like. And part of the reason that it's important that digital news organizations thrive is that they're the places where it's most common to do this reinvention of news and how users experience it. I often tell our team at Quartz that our biggest advantage, perhaps our only advantage against much bigger news organizations, is that we're not sentimental about the form of news, about the way that it has always been produced, about the way that it has been manufactured. 
So apart from our app where you can chat about the news, one of my favorite simple examples is a Quartz article from a few years ago. And you can see it on the right here. It was about Quartz, uh, it was about uh, Gap Inc.'s quarterly earnings, about one of the driest things you could write about. And other places wrote boring 700 word articles. You can see the headlines. Quartz's reporter listened to the company earnings conference call and wrote a 254 word article with a chart and the headline that you see. Banana Republic made a blazer with armholes too small for an average woman to get into. It told the story of Gap Inc.'s quality control problems succinctly and efficiently. The chart was sewn into the narrative. Another example of moving beyond traditional media production limitations is a, an email that we produce daily. It's called The Quartz Obsession, and it goes deep on a single topic. What's interesting about it in this context is it's an email that you get that actually feels like a web page. You can watch short videos, you can take surveys, you can take quizzes. Um, it's the length of a feature article, but it's deconstructed and put back together for a rich, efficient experience on your phone. So there's a lot more to do as we go forward. We have 5G wireless services launching this year. The importance of that is that it will provide high bandwidth, near zero latency data transfer. So mobile internet connection isn't a constraint for sending a video or anything else to users' phones. New phones have been demoed, like you can see here, that have folding screens so you can expand what you're reading. TV sets, despite for as long as I can remember, uh, being promised to be something more than just places where you watch television shows have yet to move beyond that, and that's another area of promise. And then there's voice. So news organizations have done some great podcasts, but the potential for voice interaction around news and around journalism actually goes very far beyond that. So that's coming as well. Will there be new or different media brands that succeed in these areas? Yes. Should there be? Yes. But looking to the news of the future, it's hard not to get stuck on the question of what people actually want. News like democracy can be thought of as a conversation. And if the readers, consumers, users, citizens don't want news, don't trust it, don't value it, then there's only so much that earnest journalists can do. There has been a clouding of truth. What is truth? Alternative facts. Truth is not truth. This is the hardest part to get our heads around. Humans biologically are wired to like propaganda and filter bubbles. It's just like we like fat and sugar. For our survival, we need to overcome information obesity. And giving people more information, like the calorie counts in restaurants and nutri nutrition labels on prepared foods are one approach. Brands used to be that seal of informational health. Brands like news organizations, like the New York Times or San Francisco Chronicle, but the internet undermined the importance of the news brand as people see individual articles only in similar Facebook formats. But that seems to be changing. The New York Times success would suggest so. There's a startup called NewsGuard. You can see here they're providing literally an informational, nutritional label for news organizations, which at the very least can be a signal that feeds into the platforms where this is distributed. NewsGuard briefly listed the Daily Mail as unreliable until recently. Um, which a lot of people herald as an amazing, gutsy achievement, although they've backtracked on that. Um, relatedly, there needs to be an active comeback against the manipulation of our news. For years, most of us uh, were too idealistic about the internet. It brought people together. There were super smart bloggers. There's an amazing thing called Wikipedia, which created this rich knowledge and ideas newosphere. But we didn't acknowledge the hacking and the manipulation and disinformation and surveillance that we all biologically are wired for, and the internet platforms were steadily enabling, and various less naive people were pursuing. Other platforms need to do everything they can do to structure, uh, to, to structure themselves so they can avoid those problems and resist the easy product and resist easy product design that manipulates our brains. But this requires active effort by the people in the industry and those who consume the news. I am happy that the media has been stripped of some of its arrogance. There is structural sexual harassment and poor treatment of women in television, for example, at CBS News and Fox News, and it was symptomatic. The role of the media in both perpetuating and exposing the perpetrators of, of sexual harassment is one of the most vexing and inspiring things about Me Too. 
Respect and equality are really important and lacks, lack of arrogance. Um, I can say that roughly 65% of Quartz's newsroom is female. Roughly 50% of our readers are female, which is rare for a business publication. We're engaged in a multi-year journalism project called How We'll Win, which is about the role we all play in getting to fair, equitable society and workplaces. And for what it's worth, I'm not totally surprised by the failure of Mike.com or the cuts at Vice, BuzzFeed, and elsewhere, Huffington Post. The hype over the years didn't match some basic business realities. Mike had trouble reaching a big advertising uh, base with its generals offering, and it bet its future on Facebook uh, video well after it was clear that that wasn't a wise thing to do. Uh, Vice is a TV studio and is reorganizing itself as, as such. BuzzFeed is cut, cutting to reach profitability, which it hopes to do. Quartz was profitable in our fourth year in 2016, and after a few years of investments, has a business plan to return to profitability. Axios, the Information Business Insider, or all other digital media startups that have operated profitably in individual years, at least. It's probably not coincidental that all of the ones that I just mentioned have some connection to business news, which professionals and investors are willing to pay for, and advertisers are willing to pay premiums to appear next to. Business news has an audience whose self-interest is tied to truth, even if it's sometimes uncomfortable. And some of the homes to the best journalism historically have been places like the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, The Economist, Reuters, Bloomberg, who write for business readers. Some of the best journalism has been business journalism. John Carreyrou's dogged reporting on corruption at Theranos amid intense legal threats is just one example, which he chronicled in Bad Blood. So does business journalism have a special role to play in our current media environment and its evolution? I'd argue that it does because the problems that, we, that it tackles are ones of public policy, accountability, and relevance to all of us. It's vital that we understand the future of work, healthcare, finance, technology, cities, taxation, and related topics that business news organizations are covering. Could the successful business model for business news, anchored by subscriptions and lucrative advertising, be applied to other areas in difficulty, such as local news? I don't know the answer, but I think it has some promise, especially if there's a niche market, when there's a niche market to serve and people are willing to pay. There are other non-business examples of news organizations thriving, such as The Athletic, the sports journalism email, The Skim, the daily email newsletter targeting a millennial uh, woman, Gimlet, the podcasting studio that Spotify just acquired. There are B Corps like Berkeley Side and nonprofits like VT Digger, those are valuable models as well. So I think the people proclaiming the end of the digital news business have too short a time frame or a failure of imagination. It's not easy, but as Samir said, the surprise positive lesson is that quality is the only defensible editorial strategy and original journalism is certainly a key element. Quartz had an important experience not long after our launch in 2012. LinkedIn was sending lots of readers to Quartz, hundreds of thousands per month, uh, which is a lot at the time for us. They were featuring our headlines and then people would click through to actually come to uh, Quartz. Then all of a sudden that number dropped to close to zero. You can see it on the chart here. Uh, LinkedIn had actually launched something which it called influencers and they'd asked people like Richard Branson to write posts on LinkedIn itself. So kind of from one day to the next, LinkedIn stopped sending people to places like Quartz and Harvard Business Review and sent them to posts on LinkedIn itself written by people like Richard Branson. If we had over-optimized our, our content to work on LinkedIn, this would have been existential. But we were young, we just rolled with it and we focused on other places like Facebook, having learned an important lesson. The quality of the content, the journalism, the creativity, the ideas were all you could really control over the long term. And you had to be pragmatic about the cycles of products and platforms and consumer habits. I think it's possible to be realistic about things like that, but also remain engaged and anchored in some optimism. As Samir said, the components of what can work are clear and editorial quality is an anchor for that. And I wasn't kidding earlier when I said that Maria and Samir 
could use your support. And in fact, all of us can play a role in this by buying quality journalism, whether it's a newspaper or a subscription to a website or, or sending money to someone like Maria. Um, I think the, the news of the future can get better, but we have to want it to. Thank you. So because I forgot to do so earlier, I will explain what will happen now. Um, uh, Kevin will join me here on stage. Uh, some of you have already put questions on index cards. Some of you will continue to do so. We'll have ushers bringing those up to uh, the front of the house. And um, we'll look forward to sharing a conversation with you for the next uh, half hour or so. So while we're waiting for our first questions to come up, um, I thought I would bring our conversation back to uh, one we had here at the Berkeley Center for New Media last year on the 53rd anniversary of the Berkeley Free Speech Movement and only, as it turned out, a week after um, Milo Yiannopoulos' uh, vast hacking of um, the university and uh, uh, its appearance in the public press to make a global media out of event out of 14 people um, assembling for 10 minutes in front of Sproul Hall. Um, uh, and so this is uh, the, the, the question of the, the dynamics of, of attention um, uh, uh, versus content that, um, uh, uh, as we were discussing, Tim Wu has talked about how the, the, the media landscape of today fundamentally changes things like speech and free speech. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that and how it's affected the business of journalism as well. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting uh, question and a dynamic, as Timu has pointed out, that our basic assumptions about free speech are actually not well equipped to handle. So the First Amendment was basically, uh, the assumption around the First Amendment was around protecting speech from government suppression, basically. But as Nicholas was saying, like what we see now is another tactic that's increasingly uh, common, and we've seen this a lot on Facebook and on Twitter and a lot of these platforms, is it's not that you're actually suppressing the speech, is you're actually just flooding people's attention with other competing things which may or may not be true that are in opposition uh, to this. And so you all know this, this is the misinformation and the propaganda. At some point people just sort of throw up their arms and say like, I really don't know what, uh, what to believe. And the effect is very similar to if you unplugged the computer or, or took away the printing press the, uh, the original speech actually just can't survive, can't break through um, on the platforms that are optimized for the, the spread of this other, uh, this other kind of speech. So I think the implications for what we all should want to see in the future of journalism, the future of news, is that, um, is that there need to be humans. And so there needs to be uh, human curators who can break through this kind of flood of information in some cases. And interestingly, it's a direction that Facebook actually was going in. They had the trending topics on Facebook, which had humans who from the sea of speech were actually pulling out things that they thought were true and interesting and relevant for the people who came to Facebook's homepage. And crazily, in the, uh, in the face of flooding of this information in comments, Facebook fired the humans who were out of that, pulling uh, the, the items that were true and worthy of our attention. This um, uh, leads in well to the next question and our first audience question. I'll also say if you feel a, a question coming over you, uh, just raise your hand and uh, if you don't already have an index card, we'll get you one. And if you're holding up an index card, we'll take it from you. Um, but the, the next question, um, and I'll, I'll expand on a little bit. Um, the question uh, questioner asks, does Quartz use any AI tools or computational automation tasks or want to? Um, and maybe you can expand even on that, on the, uh, on the impact and potential impact of machine intelligence on journalism. I know Bloomberg already has AI writing uh, business articles that would have been done by reporters, uh, you know, even five or 10 years ago. Yeah. So. Um so the answer to the question, so there are some news organizations that are, that are using AI to basically write articles or using machine learning, and they're doing th simple things like financial earnings releases, translating charts into articles, some basic sports things. If you read a box score, you can 
actually translate it into a templated article about these things. So there is some of that going on. Uh, we just got a grant. I'm really excited. We we just announced a AI um, studio at Quartz. It's it's uh, based on a grant from the Knight Foundation, and the project is to use AI in tools in the uh, pursuit of journalism. So it's it's not like taking data and then having machines write articles that could pass for human written articles. It's actually just giving journalists superpowers in their reporting to comb through big data sets and find patterns in facts that they're compiling and so forth. And so the answer to the question is that it's not a um, it's not a capability that we have now, but we've literally uh, just hired uh, some journalists and programmers to start working on this and and think that it's really super interesting and we should um, put the super AI superpowers to work. Uh, in the pursuit of truth. Um, here's a question that you and I have also uh, discussed is very relevant here um, uh, in the Bay Area, which has to do um, uh, with those global questions, but also with the effect of uh, technology to cause what the questioner calls the, the almost total collapse of local journalism. Um, uh, uh, adding my little hometown newspaper kept an eye on the politicians who ran local government, and no one is doing that now. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a big issue, and I think it is one of the great civic tragedies of our day. What's happened to local news and accountability journalism? And this, you know, is an area where Facebook and Google are are uh, adding some financial support, but it but you know, it's not it's not going to be the answer uh, to what we need here. There are some. Inter I don't know the answer, so I should start by saying that. And um, I'm not super qualified to tell you how local news is going to be uh, saved. But there are some really interesting uh, examples of ways in which people are pursuing this. Um, I, I mentioned Berkeley Side and VT Digger, uh, which are both really interesting uh, endeavors to actually figure this out. Berkeley Side, you all know, is a B Corp. VT Digger is this really interesting Vermont nonprofit where a bunch of journalists who got laid off from a newspaper in Vermont set up a newsroom and found funding a combination of sponsors, corporate sponsorship and foundation funding and membership, and they have a million and a half dollar a year operating budget, and they're able to actually do a lot of the accountability journalism that local newspapers did very, very value, valuably. So we're still trying to figure this out. Um, people need to care in communities. They can't just expect this to happen without citizens providing support in one way or another. But there are models out there that I think are are showing the way, often with uh, nonprofit foundation um, support to actually make this work. Um, this relates um, directly to another question, which is, um, as, as journalism struggles for profitability, how do you feel about billionaires like Bezos um, uh, getting into media or news business? Laureen Powell Jobs bought the other Part of another part of the Atlantic. What, what, what's the um, uh, is is this for good or ill or some combination? I think like you know at our moment in history, I think it's hard to say that this is a bad thing. Billionaires deploying their money to pay for professional journalists. I think uh, there are some meta questions that you could pose about this. You know, what if the billionaires control the news? Is that a good thing? Uh, what biases are they going to bring to coverage over time, whether through explicit or implicit signals to the people who are running the organizations that ultimately they employ? Um, and so um, I'm, I think we have to be honest about the questions that are involved. But I'm really, um, in general, enthusiastic about billionaires deploying their money to uh, to employ journalists, as long as journalists to do real reporting that we all read. The Atlantic hired something like 100 staff over the last year, thanks to the new ownership of Laureen Powell Jobs. I think that's a good thing. Um, and, and, you know, again, there, there's some caveats, and I think over time we need to hold these, them accountable to good stewardship of these organizations. But in the moment, it's hard to complain about um, 
how they're uh, deploying their money. Yeah, I, w I would step in to actually also make a direct connection to the university and even the public university where we're uh, increasingly dependent on philanthropy and, and, uh, and donations, which brings with it also the need for continued vigilance um, uh, and accountability, but is not is not something that we could do without. Yeah, and journalists are generally like pretty cranky and see through a lot of things, just as a group. If you know any journalists, you probably like could say that. So I'm sure that Mark Benioff is not getting a sort of super cozy treatment from the rank and file in the newsroom at time. Um, Here's, a, here's another question about money. Um, uh, do you worry that the shift to paywalls and subscriptions excludes those who can't afford it and leaves a class of people in the dark? I totally do. I think that's a really, really um, big issue, and it's on parallel with, uh, with local news, um, that if everything, if all news of quality requires you to pay for it, then people who can't pay for it are... Left out of um, left out of having access to that. I think that's a a, a really big issue. Um, you know, our own approach at Quartz has been that we the bulk of the content what we've traditionally produced is free. We're add, we've added membership as something additional. Some reports that do deeper dives on businesses and areas of uh, disruption in the economy. But it's really important for us that, including in places like India and Africa. Um, where we have a mission to serve uh, readers that uh, you are able to access courts without paying for it. Um, so here's a, a, a tough follow-up question from one of our audience members. Um, uh, local media across the United States is suffering, and that's well documented, but with millions of African readers of courts, what do you think of the power of balance of digital media as it crosses international borders? How will a low-paid reporter um, at the nation in Malawi compete with a courts uh, journalist covering the same topic? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, this one thing I would say to start is that it's been really important for us to have journalists uh, who come from a place covering the place. And so our model is not to have people from Brooklyn and then put them in Lagos uh, or put them in Delhi. And so I think that this is not exactly the question, but I think in terms of the sort of neo-colonial intrusion of a, a larger global media power on the information ecosystem of a country like Malawi, like. I think our approach is coherent with um, recognizing the talent uh, and and the the values of the place. I think our audiences are not the same, and our audience, interestingly, our audience for content in Africa and India sort of mixes in with the global um, content. So one. Super interesting thing, We a, a few years ago we analyzed what people in Africa, uh, readers of courts in Africa were reading as best as we could tell. Um, and they were reading the African coverage, they were reading US coverage, a lot of it was tech coverage, and they were reading a lot of coverage about India. Um, and so we that wasn't something that I actually expected to see, that our readers in Africa were actually among the voracious, most voracious consumers of the news that we were producing in India. And it, there is a logic to it. There are simil some similar economic and development um, you know, phases. There's uh, an Indian diaspora in Africa. Um, I don't think that we're competing directly with um, the local news organizations in Africa um, necessarily, but I, I also respect the, the, I think that's a good question. Um, actually, one last thing. Yeah. One thing we've tried to do is actually uh, bring the tools of courts to local newsrooms in Africa. I shouldn't forget this. And so we had an initiative two years ago, which we called Atlas for Africa. We have a charting platform, and it's called Atlas, and it's a tool that journalists can use to make charts. It's free. Um, and we got a grant, and we actually went into, courts staff went into a bunch of newsrooms um, across sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, and shared the tool with the newsrooms and talked to them about how they could use it in their work. Um, so it's a good um, uh, segue to our next question, which is about new tools in, journal in journalism or new um, kind of media phenomena that are shaping how we um, uh, 
how we consume information. There's uh, uh, two separate questions, but I'll, I'll put them together. Um, uh, one is the the prominence of, of sort of self-publishing aggregators um, uh, represented by Medium um, uh, that are kind of a, a, a the question says that they uh, seem to be trying to do a roll-up of long-form journalism as a, as a place for, for that kind of extended content. And then the second um, uh, uh, question is your uh, your thoughts on on user comments themselves, as as what uh, uh, on on articles in terms of what they do to discourse, and you talked a little bit about how you've tried to yeah. to get them to improve versus uh, demean it. But um, I'd be interested in in thinking about those new together, not uh, uh, related to I think one of the most interesting parts of your talk, which is the the ability of digital platforms to give us fundamentally new containers for information. Yeah, I I think like um, I'm. One of the things that we said in that sort of initial letter uh, when we launched Quartz to our readers was that we believe that collectively our readers much knew much more than we ever would. And I think as a journalist or as a news organization, that has to be the starting point for you, that you don't own the truth and then there are people outside. And so we've tried over the years to find ways to actually bring our readers into uh, the content. At one point, we had... Um, we had allowed people to annotate Quartz's articles. And so the idea was that you could re respond to a specific section of the article and ideally you would say, and here's a link to this amazing data source on this point, or you guys got this wrong, here's, uh, here's how you could fix it. It turns out that like, there are not a lot of people who want to spend their days annotating Quartz articles, we, we discovered. Uh, for good and bad, but it's a, but it's a premise that we actually remain pretty committed to. And as I mentioned, we've launched this platform, which is a which is an app um, that actually does have commenting on the news, um, and it's pretty constructive. We've done a few things that I think are key structural reasons for it to work. So the first thing we've done is we've recruited a bunch of people. Um, to comment regularly. And so this is people like Roger McNamee, who has a new book about Facebook, and uh, Sue Desmond Hellman, who is the head of the Gates Foundation, Kai-Fu Lee, who's a Chinese AI expert and an investor. And so they're commenting um, in a really like interesting way and kind of signaling the type of cig civic conversation that we're uh, looking for anyone can comment, but it felt important to have some people who who could model the sort of uh, conversation. The second thing is, as I mentioned, is it's structured so that you can only comment once, so you can't shout back and forth at at other people. And it turns out that that actually makes a huge difference if you can't go back and forth with someone about whether um, about Trump or Obama or whoever you want to sort of shout about. Um, it it leads to more civil conversation. And then the last thing is that we have journalists who are moderating the conversations. And so when people are, um, aren't are behaving civilly, um, we, we can push their comments down so people don't see them. There's this great thing called shadow banning, uh, which means that the person who left the profane or angry comment still sees the comment themselves, but no one else sees it. <laughs> and so that means they don't actually get mad at us because they think that we haven't, they don't realize that we've taken it down. So they're like, there are lots of techniques. And so um, we're going to, later this year, we're going to try and bring this back to the articles on QZ.com and see if we can't like get commenting uh, right for once. So the f and then the first part of the question was medium. I was maybe trying a little too eagerly to push, uh, be uh, synthesized between questions, but the the relationship between platforms like Medium for yeah. uh, and their uh, intrusion on the regular news business or their relationship to it. I think, like as you could tell from my remarks earlier, like I think it's better to have more platforms with earnest people trying to. Uh, create places where people go and read long-form journalism. I think that's a really, um, you know, that's a really good thing. The truth, you know, as you saw, the Quartz's uh, readership from Facebook went like this, and our readership from LinkedIn went like this, and then like this. And, you know, as you can see, uh, individual platforms can 
greatly affect uh, whether their users actually find a publication's content on that uh, platform. But the truth is that people want to read stuff. And so despite all of these things happening, we still have uh, tens of millions of readers every month who come to Quartz, despite the, those sort of scary charts um, that I showed you. And so I think a medium um, as another place that allows people to find stuff that they're hungry for, and I and, um, think that's a good thing. What do you think of the, um, uh, the question you referred um, uh, or made an implication that in, uh, uh, in a previous age, someone like uh, Jeff Bezos would have, uh, would have had to collaborate with a journalist for his sort of dear Mr. Pecker letter, um, but instead was able to, to put it out there as himself? Do you think that makes the world uh, a better place or is, is just uh, the nature of, of, of news in our time? It would have been a really complicated journalistic assignment to, yeah. to, get, <laughs> to get that call from Jeff Bezos and translate yeah. that into a family-friendly right. article. Um, so I think it's a fact and like, fine. He wrote a really um, kind of bold and funny uh, post on Medium and if there's no journalist as an intermediary, he could have in earlier ages uh, written it as a, you know, press release and put it on the press wire. I don't know. It seems like that that doesn't bother me. Um, so here it's, uh, th this is a, a Berkeley question, but I think it's also uh, a question, you know, at the heart of a lot of our, um, at the intersection of hopes and fears, let's say, about news, which is uh, uh, what if, or do you think there is a chance that um, business news for uh, uh, at least a financial elite is uh, the only business of news that survives? Do you think that is, a, is the prospect that we face? Um, I don't think so. And I think it's because there are other examples of categories of people. And you, you may not find this like any more reassuring, but paid or, or journalism for sports enthusiasts apparently has a bright future. Journalism for millennial women apparently has a bright future. Um, and you can go kind of down the categories, you know, podcasting actually, you know, we just had some examples uh, with Anchor and Gimlet being acquired by Spotify, really super powerful platform there, has a pretty bright future as far as I can tell. And so I don't know that the categories of journalism that are financially viable, independent of support from members, philanthropists, foundations, good souls is, I don't know how infinite that category of um, journalism is, um, but it's definitely bigger than just business journalism. Um, so the, the, we're going to finish with the, uh, our last two questions are more, more inside the business of journalism. Um, one is, um, uh, which I'm interested in the question to as, <laughs> as well, is how has Quartz managed to avoid the curse of the, quote, pivot to video? And where does moving images and other forms of interactive media factor into your long game or even medium game? Yeah. Um, Quartz has some great journalists who are, who are working on video. We have this show which happens to be uh, distributed on Facebook where we weekly uh, do field reporting in, uh, and we've done a bunch in China and in Africa and the latest one was in Lisbon and talking to uh, people about how the rise of Airbnb and people wanting to be act like locals when they're tourists has basically destroyed Lisbon for a lot of the people who live there. And so we have some great original journalism that's going on there. We didn't pivot to video and stake our entire future on it. We see it more as one of the ways in which we are journalists and one of the forms in which our journalism takes. I wish that, that video was a lot easier. So it's pretty expensive from a business standpoint. And this um, idea that there's a kind of magical model for how you, um, how you finance it is clearly not been true, and Mike and a bunch of other places have painfully um, demonstrated that. Um, there is a, There are business models around distribution. So um, television channels, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon 
are paying for um, video content. And that's among the things that we think about. We've had one of our stories is being optioned for a TV series. Another one is being shopped as a documentary for some place. So those are play ways in which you can kind of creatively finance further investment in journalism. Um, and then the last question, I think, is a is a, a wonderful one to end on, and a very sincere question from um, our most cherished community at Berkeley, which is our students. Um, what can a student um, or a student of journalism do to be well prepared for whatever the future of news is to bring? How can we both leaders and co-conspirators in innovation? That's a great question. Thanks. Um, I think the thing that the thing that um, basically when we're, I'll sort of go to how we, at Quartz, we, um, what we're looking for in journalists, which may be one way to, um, to answer. Like we look at our journalists, can they write some basic things? Uh, do they have some relevant experience to what we would be looking to do? And then the fundamental thing for me, and when I'm interviewing journalists who are, who are coming to, uh, to work at courts, the fundamental thing that I look for is, is this a curious person? Because f more than training in a specific video produ production technique or CMS or whatever the, um, the specific tactic you can learn, if you're not a fundamentally curious person, you're gonna really struggle to excel in this profession. And so when I talk to um, journalists in this context, I'll say like, I'll try and just get them talking, talking about stories and see, is this person just curious about things? And one of the most memorable times was uh, speaking with Ann Quito, who is Quartz's design reporter. Um, and she started, she came in and she was telling me, before she started, she was telling me about a trip where she had gone to uh, Manila. And she said, yeah, I went to Manila in the Philippines to, um, to do some reporting for this freelance magazine piece about something. And she said, yeah, and I actually, like, while I was there, I went to this neighborhood in Manila where there, um, there are forgers, and you can hire these forgers to forge a passport or a driver's license. Or, um, and so she got a Pulitzer Prize forge, certificate forge, like, with her name. So I thought, <laughs> like, this is pretty cool. Um, and then she, she said, you know, and they're actually, like, these really um, sort of archaic forms of calligraphy that are practiced and preserved in this neighborhood in Philippines because they're used on diplomas. Like, so this sort of form of calligraphy that is used on, so there are these Philippine forgery artists who were, um, who were preserving these ancient forms of calligraphy. And I thought, wow, this is really, like, this is super interesting. And when you're gonna, we're gonna hire you, you're gonna write both of these stories. Um, <laughs> And then she said, yeah, and I was there in a typhoon, and it was really interesting um, because I was taking a car to the airport, and all of the, the, the road to the airport is lined with billboards on, you know, just kind of standard billboards, and um, the billboards themselves had actually been removed because they were afraid that the, they would basically take flight in the typhoon and endanger people. Um, she said, but it was super fascinating visually because there's the, the, these kind of exoskeletons of the billboards were still there, these kind of rusting steel skeletons. And she said, you know, it's as if like the skeleton of our commercial society uh, was laid bare and she had taken a bunch of photos on Instagram. And so, and that was like, you have to write that story like after, <laughs> after we hire you. And so... The, the answer, it's a long way of answering the question, but the answer is like, you have to be a good writer and, um, and read, reading is I think for any young person, especially journalists is like the number one thing you can do um, to, to, for self-improvement. Reading books, reading, um, reading long form journalism. Um, but beyond that, sort of gaining any experiences you can and actually, um, testing yourself on just how curious you are um, is another like key thing to do if you aspire to be a, a successful journalist. That is a great note to end on. I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking Kevin Delaney very much for joining us. Thank you for coming.
Thank you.